Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've got all my instruments uh, up here. Uh, and congratulations on your Chatier Institute for Sustainability in Engineering and Design. Uh, I think this puts you among world leaders in this area. And it gives me hope for humanity that we can collectively address this uh, problem. Uh, my talk is going to be on sustainable manufacturing. I'll do it in three pieces. What is sustainable manufacturing? I'd like to show you some historical trends on efficiency and growth. And then I'd like to focus on specifically what I think engineers can do, what I've seen them in doing to address issues of sustainability. This last summer, I had a nice opportunity to go to a, a US uh, National Science Foundation workshop on sustainable manufacturing. They invited various experts in this area, and our charge was to come up with a agenda for sustainable manufacturing and identify barriers and challenges to our area. Um, and then, you know what happened is that uh, we identified the biggest barrier was no clear definition of what sustainable manufacturing is. If you have no definition, it's kind of hard to set targets. You know, when I first got in this field, I thought, well, come on now. You're, you're more efficient. You recycle. You use some renewable energy. What's so hard about that? But when you dig into it, it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than you might think. I think the number one problem for engineers is the change in scale. You see, pe different people have different definitions of what sustainability is, but my definition, and I think for a lot of us, is the fact that we are, as human beings, now affecting the planet on a global scale. This is unprecedented, okay? So this is a large scale problem. Often engineers work at a smaller scale. You may be charged with making an energy efficient small refrigerator. How do you connect between one scale to the next? There's a lot going on in between those two activities. Let me give you some, act, uh, some examples. Here uh, shows a historical pattern of energy efficiency in pig iron production. Pig iron is major energy using and carbon emitting component of making steel. Now, we've been making steel for a long time. This goes back more than 200 years. And you can see, measured in terms of kilograms of pig iron per gigajoule of energy, we've been making some great progress on efficiency. All right? We studied this for nine different activities. We looked at materials. We looked at electricity. We looked at various services. And we found the following pattern. This shows both efficiency goes up, but also production goes up. So while you get a very impressive uh, improvement in efficiency, 30 to 1, production goes up by 90 to 1. Okay? We looked at aluminum. Now, aluminum is a newer material. It has, doesn't have the same uh, long, long time uh, history, uh, but nevertheless, it has an impressive four to one improvement in the, uh, efficiency while production has increased by 32 to one. These are global numbers. We looked at uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Again, similar pattern. Improvement four to one, production 36 to one. When we looked at all these different activities and we plotted them on one plot, you get this kind of a thing. Let me explain. This is the annual change on this uh, y-axis, the annual change in production or consumption on the bottom axis is the annual, annual change in uh, efficiency. If efficiency were outrunning production, you, these average values here would be down on that region of the plot. They're all above the plot. The ones I showed you are circled, but everything is up there. Okay? What's going on? Well, it's complicated. I don't want to... Uh, oversimplify, oops, let me back up here. I don't want to oversimplify, but as I said, there's a lot going on between the action of the engineer and how society uses that um, activity, that, those results. Basically, to the extent possible, people do what they want to do. Consumers want to satisfy their needs and procreate. 
producers want to profit and expand their market share. Okay, so I'm oversimplifying, but I think this is the essence of what's going on. Now, there were some exceptions. We then looked at decade-long periods where the reverse might be true, and these are examples where the reverse happens, efficiency outpaces production. But in almost every case, this was related to a market downturn, okay? The one uh, exception was residential refrigerators in the United States over the 16-year period, okay? This was due to some uh, efficiency mandates. What's going on here, but why, why the exception? Because the other, some of the other areas also had efficiency mandates. Here you can show the, uh, 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 the progress in that same plot. You can see them moving into this region on the plot crossing the line, okay? So why are refrigerators different? Because of saturation. For a long time, people were perfectly happy with one refrigerator per household. That did it. Okay, now you put the old refrigerator down in the basement, the new one's upstairs, but we still, uh, we still don't need that many refrigerators, all right? Now, uh, you're a refrigerator manufacturer. Are you happy with this picture? No, you want to sell more refrigerators. So you're gonna come up with new designs Refrigerators that give you ice water, refrigerators that are so big you can put a half a cow in them, or little tiny ones you can put them in every room of your house, right? I was in, I had an opportunity to visit some colleagues uh, in Italy recently, and Italy is known for their design, and I said, what do you think about this? What, uh, what's going on in this area? And they showed me this very interesting uh, example. There's a company in Italy called Smeg, S-M-E-G, that makes a refrigerator that looks like the front end of the Fiat 500. Isn't that cute, huh? Now I'm guessing this doesn't go in the, re in the kitchen. But you gotta be careful, you put it in the garage. When you get up in the morning to go to work, you better, better make sure you get in the right device. Right? So the picture is more complicated. We saw at least one example of success. There are things we can do we need to learn about this, but what can engineers do? I see sort of three general areas where engineers go. Number one is, people, some people say, look, we're engineers. We build good stuff, society does whatever it's gonna do, but uh, that's up to society, we're gonna make uh, good stuff. And I'll show you some examples of some very remarkable products that have been developed, and if implemented, could make a big difference for us. Now there's another route where engineers roll up their sleeves and they say, you know what, we can figure this out. We want to know more about this, okay? And so now we get into interdisciplinary kinds of activities where engineers start to rub shoulders with economists uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and other uh, branches of social sciences and start to learn how people behave and how these things are uh, come about. And then there's a third area, which I'd like to label separately, is uh, mostly designers who say, look, no one's gonna get this stuff if it looks like pain, we gotta make this look like fun, all right? So let me talk a little bit about uh, the engineers. Some of the remarkable things engineers do, and I'm gonna show you some examples, are what I call the existence proof. You can run through a scenario forward and you can say, look, um, if we wanna solve, if, it, if climate change is the issue, our carbon emissions are going up, but we gotta reduce is there some technology that could actually help us get from this trajectory to that? In other words, even with growth, because there's plenty of people in the developing world who want the same stuff we have, even with growth, can we get down there? I'll give you two examples, okay? So all hope is not lost. Cheer up, I mean, it's not all bad news here. Uh, but here's the conflict. So these examples I'm gonna show you have to do with dramatic efficiency changes. But if you do a little incremental efficiency changes, is that a contribution to sustainability? Well, I just showed you. We've been doing incremental efficiency changes. So that's business as usual. And I think this is maybe the core of the dilemma that we had at that workshop 
last summer was differentiating between what helps and what's business as usual. Let me give you some examples. And let's look in three, three important areas, but I'm actually going to focus mostly on the housing. We're going to look at addressing this problem by efficiency. There are other tools in the toolkit, but time's short here, so we're just going to do efficiency. I'm going to look specifically at housing and in automobiles. And right away, here are some very impressive examples. One is a uh, house a design and certification program called Passive House. I used the German spelling. I understand it actually started in, in Canada. But the Germans have picked up on this and have made very, very dramatic reductions in the energy required uh, for housing. And in particular, the number I've shown here, which probably doesn't mean anything to you, I'll translate in a minute, uh, and in heating requirements. All right. Another example down here is a car that's produced by Volkswagen. You can buy it right now. It's called the XL1. It's kind of pricey. But XL1 means it gets, uh, it can go 100 kilometers on one liter of gasoline. Translate into the way we talk about it, 260 miles per gallon. Anybody getting 260 miles per gallon? And you can fit two people in there too. Okay, these are existence proof. This is dramatic. All right, let me now let me translate these for you. I did the calculation. What what do I consume in my house and in my car? And in both cases. The difference is eight to one. That's a pretty big reduction. All right. Now, if we implemented that, what would the consequences be? I'm not going there, but this shows uh, what's what's available. I'll make a point at the same time that you'll see the uh, potential improvement in the integrated steel mill is not as large. Now, why is that? I showed you earlier. We've been getting efficient in steel in these materials. And in fact, we're getting so efficient, we're approaching thermodynamic limits. Okay, So they're going to have to look at other kinds of solutions. This one is limited in what it can do. Let me talk just a little bit then about the analytical approaches. i just give you an overview of what, of what engineers are doing. I think we're making some great progress now putting together the picture of how Materials flow, energy flows, products connect to the globe. So this is, I think, you know, we, we, we look at these things as long as they're valuable or we do national accounts internally, but there are a lot of parts of the puzzle that we don't look at. Scrap material is not tracked uh, very well. Waste is not tracked very well. But now we have these pictures. In fact, your next speaker, uh, Julian Allwood, has done a lot in this area. Other, a number of other people have too. I've given you an example on the bottom. This is a flow, this shows a global flow of carbon embedded in products that get traded around the world, okay? So you may look at your national accounts and say, you know, our carbon emissions don't look so bad. See, in the old days, before we did so much exporting and importing, your production and your consumption were more or less equivalent, but that's not true anymore because you're making up for that your carbon might be flat because you're importing carbon in the goods that come in. Now, to do this kind of calculation actually turns out to be quite complicated. You have to start from the production of the material. You have to trace that material into products and components. You have to assemble that because now the products have many, many different materials, and then you have to track that around the world. Okay, So that gets us to things uh, like multi-regional input-output models. Now, engineers are definitely rubbing shoulders very closely with economists. We're getting interdisciplinary activity, uh, talking to each other. It's a very good activity, gives us great insights. And finally, I'll mention a new version on life cycle assessment. Maybe you've heard of life cycle assessment. There's uh, at least two flavors, okay? One, the conventional one, um, I'll give you an example to explain the difference. The conventional one might be to look at corn ethanol and compare it to gasoline as a fuel. So you look at the kinds of resources you need to make the fuel, and you look at the kind of performance you get when you burn the fuel. The energy value, the CO2 emissions, everything else that goes on. That's the conventional life cycle assessment. The consequential life cycle assessment is when you look further and you say, well, now wait a second, if we grow corn to make fuel, we'll occupy land 
and uh, will divert corn from food products to fuel products. There'll be some competition. There'll be some dynamic there. It'll probably affect food prices. Okay, this is a very new area, and again, it, it, it starts to overlap significantly with economics, but it's quite obvious that we have to look that way to plan ahead to know the true trajectory of these, of these technologies. Okay, and then finally, make sustainability fun. I think actually the two examples I gave you um, were a good uh, illustrations. I mean, this car looks pretty cool, right? Got the gull wings that come up, and uh, I haven't seen one. Um, but from this picture, it looks nice. The house is a nice example of a passive, passive house. Um, <clears throat> I kind of like this vehicle here, which is actually a pedal. It's a solar-assisted pedal-powered uh, vehicle. Uh, also, uh, I've thrown in here new business models, maybe not make sustainability fun, but make it uh, affordable. There are these business models where, for example, you want to install PV, you don't want to bear the capital cost. There, uh, people have set a business, well, they'll, they'll, they'll put up the capital, but you have to share the gain of the low cost electricity over time. And then finally, these things uh, uh, will require societal change to accommodate them. I'm actually seriously thinking of getting uh, this at about $5,000, but I don't think I'd feel safe in traffic, and I think I'd get in the way of the bicycles. So I'm not exactly sure where I'm gonna, where I'm gonna drive it, okay? Okay, so the last thing is a little musical interlude. As I was preparing this talk, I was on my way to work. Pink Cadillac, do you remember that song? Came on by uh, Bruce Springsteen. And for some reason, I listened to the words. And I'm gonna share that with you, but first, to get you in the mood, can we have a few bars of Pink Cadillac for the crowd? Remember? Okay. All right, all right. Okay, you got it. All right. So now listen to the words. Maybe you did. Maybe you already did, but I didn't until. So here's the problem. I love you for your pink Cadillac, crushed velvet seats, riding in the back, oozing down the streets, waving to the girls, feeling out of sight, spending all my money on a Saturday night. If this ain't unsustainable, I don't know what is. And it sounds like so much fun. I mean, when I hear this song, I want to buy a pink Cadillac. I didn't buy one, but that's the feeling it gives me. All right, but the song is actually deeper than that. He identifies the conflict. Now, some folks say it's too big and uses too much gas. Some folks say it's too old and that it goes too fast. But my love is bigger than a Honda. It's bigger than a Subaru. I mean, this is a tough dilemma for this guy. However, this song was written back in 1984, and I think if he's checked, the Honda and the Subaru are a lot bigger now. All right, but he's got another solution. Look at this. Anyway, we don't have to drive it, honey. We could park it out in back and have a party in the pink Cadillac. There you go. On our way to sustainability. Now, if he can have that party without the car, it's even better. huh? So we can make sustainability fun. All right, existence proof, tools and knowledge, make sustainability fun. Thank you very much.